Hi, everyone. Hi out there, Chris. Good to see you eating your popcorn. Always there. I appreciate you. Welcome to Love at First Laugh. Today, I have a great guest and we're going to have so much fun. He's been, this is his third time on Love at First Laugh, the Green Room Edition. And we're going to do some reading and some um, talking about his pieces, Sheltered in Place, that he posts on Facebook. He posted for like a whole year and now he stopped and we're all sad and crying but he's here and please welcome the fabulous amazing incredible super guy steve scroven yay thank you grace how are you doing how everybody out there hi yeah everybody they're already saying hi to you hi to steve for me there's chris saying hi to you already hi chris and he's eating popcorn he does that all the time <laughs> Yeah, like we're a movie theater now, but yeah, this is COVID, right? Yeah. <laughs> we, we are the movie theater. We are, yes. This, this is a sad state of affairs, but uh, have your popcorn, your peanut M and M's. That's what I do at movies. <laughs> That's right, and we'll talk about some M and M's because today you're going to start. You're going to actually talk. We'll discuss like anything from Megan and Harry to how to properly eat M and M's. Yes, yes. Yeah. Anything you want. We covered anything. the gamut. Yes. We the gamut. Yes. That's awesome. So we're going to start with my favorite topic, which is marriage, as always, because I am fascinated with the fact that you've been married for, what, 200 years? Uh, 34? 34. Same but we've been together for 43. 43? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's I I just you're my idol. I just like worship you in the marriage department. You just I don't know how you do it, and I seek advice from you. Like a, like you're my sage, my marriage sage. Well, you want to do? Do you want to? Do you want to read the the relevant uh, piece that uh, addresses this? Yes. Well, yes. You want me to read the whole thing? I'll read the whole thing. Or um, yeah, or I could whatever. However, you want to do it. No, that's totally cool. I read it because this is okay. delicious. Okay. So sheltered in place day 364. So this was like the day before you ended, right? Because you ended at 365. Right. So you talk about marriage. This is how important it is. Before you end, you want to just give us some more marriage material right here. Okay. I've told this story often about how Shelly and I were a couple for nine years before we got married. That includes nine years? Holy Okay, that includes the two-year engagement and how, unlike the stereotype of the commitment-phobic man, I was ready to get married before she was. It took her nine years to marry me, I tell people. I, well, this is what I put in my notes, never mind. Uh, Shelly would usually smile indulgently without comment, having heard this bit many times before. I could have become a doctor in that time, I'd say. I certainly went through a lot of the same stages. I did my internship, my residency, she got a dog to see how I treated the dog, taught me to cook. It finally dawned on me that I was indeed, I was a, in a kind of graduate school, wed school, or at least domesticated to the point where I could qualify for a job as an entry level husband. Hmm. But even at my advanced stage, come on, I'm still a work in progress. Every once in a while, I remind her there are remote corners of this wilderness that remain yet untamed. These areas are marked by random periodic releases of methane. So the Pygmal Pygmalion, Pygmalion, I, I have an accent, so correct me. Project is ongoing. The Sistine Chapel needs just one more coat. I'm not sure that's such a bad thing. I'd like to think I'm one of Siegfried and Roy's white tigers. Generally soft and cuddly, but you still need to watch your fingers. Ooh, okay, we're going to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Mr. Scroven. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to ask you, um, do you think that men know they want a woman like right off the bat, like immediately? Or does it take a little bit to say, hey, this is the woman I want to marry? Uh, I don't know, because I can't speak for all men. All I can do is speak for myself in that uh, there are certain people who are hooked on the rush of the beginning of the relationship. And they, that, you know, that's what energizes them. And, you know, science has told us that, that there are actually things firing in your brain mm -hmm. that then after about six months, settle down. And yeah. then you decide whether this is really a person, you know, so all that romantic rush settles down. 
And I kind of never, I don't know how I, you know, my chemistry is, but yeah, I certainly enjoyed the romantic uh, rush, but it was not, uh, it was like, I wish I could freeze dry to six months later to see if this is actually going to work and are we wasting our time? And so I think most people, I wouldn't necessarily as guys, can get hooked on, you know, I, once that rush is over, I'm going to move on to somebody else because I'm, I'm looking for that score. I'm trying to, I'm going to tie off and try somebody else. And I was never that way. And so that, I think that's why we've been together for so long is because uh, I think we're both that way to a certain extent. And we would have to be, but I was never uh, enamored of that of that romantic first beginning. I wasn't hooked on that. I wasn't an addict to that. So it, uh, I think, uh, mm. you know, that's why, I, you know, in our relationship, like I say, I was, I was ready before she was, it wasn't like I was pushing for it. Cause come on, I'm still a guy. Yes. So I, uh, I was definitely ready before she was. Yeah. And, uh, I remember uh, a Christmas morning, you know, we'd been engaged for two years and finally Shelly's older sister said, Shelly, when are you going to get married? And I thought, thank you. Thank you for saying that because I couldn't do it. And that's when she actually started making plans and we finally were married by that August. Good. So you took her off the market. Took her off the market. Yes, if you want to yeah. be very mercenary. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's off the market. I'm off the market. And yeah. we're both stone cold dead in the market. C completely. You've been, yeah. I'm the opposite. I'm enamored of being in love but it, it can last like one date and then i'm like ah forget it i don't like i eat toasts Blah. yeah well i'm kind of like that person well if you think about it that was the whole kind of um ethos of, of seinfeld the seinfeld show oh yeah which was you know it was a lot about dating and you find somebody who doesn't eat their peas right no that's it or somebody yeah. looks it looks like they pick their nose and they're gone and, you know, so I worked on that show for a year and it was a hard show for me to be on because my life experience and my temperament didn't reflect that. Yeah. Um, uh, it was, you know, I don't have dating stories, really. Right. Uh, except from, you know, high school, early college. So I didn't have all of that stuff. And I wasn't in that head of, you know, trying to find somebody and then easily find them. I think your ride's there, Grace. By the way. Oh, they're coming for me. That's OK. Yeah. We have five more minutes. By the time they park and everything, yeah. Maybe yeah. you've been here before, yeah. So that is what, uh, uh, you know, that's just how I made. And I, I don't know whether I was just born that way or was, you know, the example of my parents. Who knows how, how that happens? Wait, I wonder what it is. I think it's like everything. Some's nature, some's nurture, you some's know. Nurture, yeah. I think yeah. people have, you know, have a hard time getting married if thinking about it, if they come from a divorce. Uh, it's not everybody, of course, but if you don't have a good model for that, and both, you know, Shelly and I had parents who stayed together their entire lives, and wow. uh, till death did they part, and uh, so that's the example we had, and, um, you know, there was nothing scary about it. There was nothing traumatic about, you know, our experience there, uh, you know, watching parents go through a divorce or serial marriages or whatever else, so... We thought, hey, this I, this seems to work. This system, totally. So we bought into it. Yeah. Well, Chris here says, I wouldn't last forty three minutes be married to just tagging your forty three years. Yeah. Uh, so, what advice would you give Chris uh, if you wanted to? Chris, I would keep eating your popcorn, Chris, because uh, <laughs> it's much. It could be much fun, much more fun to watch the show to actually be in it. <laughs> good answer <laughs> good one uh great i love it uh so okay so you say it took you nine years to earn your doctorate in domestication yes so what are the steps of domestication well like i said you know it was like i mean you know this was the joke was that it was nine years and i looked at it and i said wait a minute yeah you go to medical school you do all this stuff and nine years later you could become a doctor and that's what I was being trained, which also was uh, kind of uh, soothing because I realized she would never leave me because she doesn't have that kind of time to train somebody else. Right. Exactly. She it's what's called sunk costs. She's yeah. sunk too much time yeah. to me 
so that, you know, I, I knew I was, you know, she was just going to run away no matter how many times she threatened to. Yeah. <laughs> and she seems to be, Shelly seems to be a very practical and intelligent woman. So of course, yeah. when I take care of her investment. Yes. No, no, you definitely. She's going to take care of her investment yeah. and nurture it, you know, and it's still, like I say, the sculpture I'm, is not done yet. I, I may look like Michelangelo's David, but <laughs> yeah. there are still some things that need to be filed down and, you know. Mm -hmm. So what it, do you think are the last touches that you need to like take care of? Uh, well, that's a better question for her. I mean, okay. uh, uh, probably uh, the farting could be worked on. <laughs> uh, You're a boy, you can't help it. The, <laughs> Fascination with farts. I have a student. And because uh, I tutor Spanish, right? And and I, he says, you know what my life is? It's Pokemon, Transformers, and farts. Uh huh. Wow, that sounds like uh, that could be a song title. It, totally, I know. I was like, bravo! You yeah. have to find boys all over the world. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think there are still um, some listening things that uh, you know still still get uh, filed in the complaint department. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there, there's, there's some, there's some things. Yeah. You, you'd rather keep them private. I hear you. But well, no, it's just that, you know, I, you don't, you don't know. You're not sure. You, I'm you're nearly perfect. perfect is what I'm trying yeah, to say. That's what I was going to say in your eyes. You're perfect. Yeah. I don't know what, yeah. what, what, what could you, what more can you do? Look, but, but that's another thing about relationships. It's like, I think I'm perfect. And then they, they bring up flaws. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I am yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah. So how do you deal with that when they bring up, when she brings up the flaw and you're like, what are you talking about? Uh, uh, pouting usually happens or, uh, you know, <laughs> stomping off into the other room and, yeah. you know, it's yeah. the usual childish things, which <laughs> may be another thing she's working on. So Absolutely, always, always something. Totally. If I was if I was too easily mastered, she would lose interest. You know, that's the same thing yeah. with a job, with anything in life, with art. If it's too easily mastered, then it's it's you know you get bored. You want to keep that edge, right? But yeah. Well, that's why I said that thing in the post about you know uh, Siegfried and Roy's tigers, because you don't want to be completely tame like a you know, a fat kitten sitting on the shelf, you know, you want to keep it, you know, there's parts of you, you could still, you know, bite. Yeah. But what will happen when Steve scrolling is perfect, which might happen very soon. because It's been a long time. <laughs> so what's good. Oh, what are you going to do? Steve Scrooge is perfect. I think uh, the entire uh, universe will be sucked into a black hole. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be a sign of the apocalypse. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, this is, let's see, Chris. He says, since I, to be honest, since I've stopped looking, I've been happier and made more female friends. Yep. Yeah. Same here. Yep. When I want to know, Chris, is is that uh, an accurate uh, rendition of you as uh, in the, with yeah. the, yeah, that's what you really look like? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can you be yes. or, or are you just like uh, some some pseudo Magnum PI dude? Uh, yeah, that's how he looks like. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm looking at you, Chris, and you 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 look like quite the catch. Yeah, he's adorable. He's totally yeah. adorable. Yeah, uh, I know, I know. And, and yeah, look at him. Look at me. We're we're adorable. And yet, why aren't you two together? There you go. Ooh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, maybe we should. He lives in Canada, though. Oh, well, that means he's nice. The nicest people in the world in Canada. Oh, my God. He's so nice. He's a very nice guy. Okay. Well, I'm Canadian. He says he's very proud of being Canadian. I was on his podcast yesterday, and he agrees with you that Canadians are <laughs> very nice. Yeah. I worked I, yeah. I, I, know, I, I worked up there for a couple of months, and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, the Canadians I know who work down here, just good people. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. They're great. And they uh, look at us, they look at us like we're the yeah. we're older brother who's just keeps fucking up and 
you know, it's like George and Lenny from Of Mice and Men, you know, and we, you know, we're just this big galoot who just can, you know, kill your puppies. And uh, in Canada, they're going, just take it easy. Just take it easy. Take it easy, Lenny. Don't get mad. Don't throw, you know, you got nukes. Totally. Uh, you know what? I forgot to read. I put this in red. Like what I'm supposed to say, I put it in red and I, I messed up. There's more to your piece. Did I read this recently? The subject? No, I didn't. No, we, but that's okay. That's okay. It's it's okay. We don't need it. Okay, we're gonna move on. Okay. Let's move on. Okay, I love the interaction that you and Jelly um Jelly Jelly. Did I say Jelly? You just did. You got a little bit of a come before the show. I don't know. That's beyond an accent. That's just like my blonde hair. You know what? They pulled my hair like up, and it kind of yes. like it's yeah. In my brain, I think when it's, yeah, yeah there's well, no blood flow, the whatever. In, like your hair is blonde. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes. Well, not the roots, but we'll take care of that next week. Um, so so here is, I love this this piece. Um, it's sheltered in place day 352. So and I don't know if you want to read this one. I think this one, you you would be better at reading better this. Better reading this one? Okay. Because you were there. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is, uh, yeah. We had uh, tree trimmers prune our mulberry a couple of weeks ago. And, all, and this is absolutely true. Shelly asked them to grind up the branches for mulch, which left, left us with a huge pile in the driveway. And it was my job to shovel that mulch into containers so Shelly could distribute it properly throughout the yard. And while I was at it, our four-year-old neighbor, Everett, a uh, cute kid from across the street, uh, you know, he said, Mr. Steve, you know, that's me. Uh, you know, he asked me what I was shoveling and I told him mulch. And he said, what's mulch? And I said, uh, you know, you put this stuff on top of the soil and when it rains, it holds the water and lets it sink into the ground instead of running off into the street. And I said, it's kind of like a sponge. And later when I related to this exchange to Shelly, she explained that what's really happening Evaporation is when water molecules stick to each other and form a string that leaves the soil. The mulch is a different texture that prevents those molecules from grabbing onto each other and forming those chains. And the fungi in the mulch helps to hold the moisture and distribute it throughout the soil. I said, hey, the kid's four years old. I can't be sure he knows what a sponge is, let alone molecules and fungi. But as a certified permaculturist and master compost, Shelley knows a lot about the science of soil. As a stand-up comedian, I know a lot about audiences. I told her, hey, you're not playing Lincoln Center. This is a one-nighter in New Jersey. And she said, she wasn't talking to him. She was explaining it to me. And I said, I repeat, you're not playing Lincoln Center. I love it. My question to you is, what kind of room do you think she's playing? She's not playing Lincoln Center. She's playing mu uh, Mustache Pete's in, <laughs> in Fort Lee. Why? Why do you? Why do you think that's uh, your the room? Because she's smarter than me, and she knows more about certainly this subject than I do. And you know, she knows more about science and the science of soil, definitely. So yeah. you got to dumb it down for the for the people. For the yeah, absolutely. And I I have something a uh, psychology question here. Uh, you always portray your wife as smarter than you. Yeah. Do you think it's better that the woman be smarter than the man in a relationship? Uh, well, again, I don't want to generalize. In my case, we, um, you know, I, I, I was kind of a, you know, I came from a small town outside in Northeast Ohio, outside of Cleveland, about 30 miles, let's say, Cleveland. Shelly came from a college town on the East Coast, Princeton, New Jersey. And, uh, you know, we had just different backgrounds. And I think we have a thing coming up later that touches on that. Right. And uh, I immediately, I, I'm attracted to smart. And like I was saying before about getting bored in a relationship, yeah. uh, when you are, if I was smarter than my partner, I would probably get bored. Mm -hmm. And that might be, you know, and and when I'm talking about smart, there's different kinds of smart. There's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, book smart, street smart, different kinds of smart. 
uh, and it's not like I'm not saying I'm dumb, but I'm no, you're not. IQ, Hello. in terms of IQ, yeah. I immediately recognize somebody, you know, like a standard deviation ahead of me. Okay. So that was attractive to me. And uh, I've learned a lot. I didn't count on all the correction. But <laughs> well, that happens with lower IQ women too. Trust me. Yeah, probably. Yeah, right. even more frustrating because they they would be correcting you and also be wrong. So it's better yes. at least going to correct you. They be right. Exactly. And, and that's you know that's what uh, I was in for. So I don't know if it cuts along gender lines. It could be you know that 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 a woman is looking to be challenged more by a man who can learn. You know and. Uh, you know, learn from that. And so like on a straight IQ level, I know that she's got a little bit more horsepower than I do. And, yeah. uh, and I think I was, I was drawn to that. Somebody yeah. different. It's almost like being drawn to an alien intelligence. Totally. Yeah. To be honest, I kind of like my men dumb. And why is that? Because then I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I'm an alpha female. I like them beta. But yeah. they're not necessarily dumb. I was kidding. I like them beta. I really, with alpha men, it's kind of hard for me. Yeah. Like, the are so nice. Like, they're you wanna so. Be, you want to be the boss. Yeah, and they like it. Yeah. Well, so you want to be the CEO of the relationship. Yes. And so you're looking for, for uh, some, some cheap labor <laughs> that you can exploit. Uh, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, not cheap labor, but um, I guess um, easy uh, to manipulate labor. <laughs> you sound like quite a catch, too. I am. <laughs> Where, Chris? I'm telling you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Not really. <laughs> I'm actually very nice and sweet. Very nice. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, I know that yeah. part. I know that part, but, yeah. you know. And, you know, when you put together, when a relationship is like two, you know, like an electron and an, it's, it's like an atom that you put together and all depends on what the charges in those atoms are. And like you can, uh, you know, some, some are more unstable. Some is uranium 235 and will explode. And some is, some are stable and some yeah. you know, H2O, that's water. That, that's a relationship that'll flow. And uh, did Shelly teach you that? No, no, no. This is no, I, you know it by yourself. I'm just coming up with this off the top of my head. Actually. That's amazing. I thought Shelly had like you know taught you about all these. No, but things. but oh. what in the in the head of you know the fact that the water molecules are you know attaching on a string yeah. and evaporating. I was I guess I was kind of in that head, and now I'm taking some artistic license with that. Totally. So you're saying it's chemistry. It is chemistry. It is is really putting these chemicals together, and almost literally chemistry because you know pheromones are involved. Yes, you're right. And uh, you know that's that's actually I wrote something else just recently. I didn't post it or anything, but um, you know it has to do with being attracted to each other's um, yeah. scent in a way. You know something primal like that. Yeah. Uh, in my case, my dating life would be called Breaking Bad. <laughs> That's my chemistry. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Chris, look, Chris is, uh, I don't know. What do you think, Steve? You're like my sage. He's saying he he is cheap. Cheap labor. I think. And he says he likes being bossed around. <laughs> oh, boy. I think you guys, <laughs> I think you guys got to gotta get together. I want to see this happen. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that sounds, he sounds like uh, my ideal guy. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk. We'll talk He's, after the show with Chris. I <laughs> wants to be on the chain gang. <laughs> you wear your mirrored shades and just crack the whip. Well, I have several whips. <laughs> well, I, but that's a different show. Cool um, yeah. <laughs> well, what we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> yes. Uh, so let me let's let's go with the cultural differences because I think that's a good segue into. Um, so uh, I'm going to read parts of this one if that's okay. 
Yes. Uh, yes. So you, yeah, because, okay, so you talk about this once you say, even though we're both, Shelly and you are both um, of white European heritage, we were raised in vastly different family cultures. Once early in the relationship, she mentioned the book Bird Rabbit. I don't even know what that is. No idea either. Just say no idea. I have no idea what that is. Br Br Never Rabbit. What is it? Br'er Rabbit. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I'll Google that later. Never heard of it. She was astonished. Well, <laughs> I am too, Steve. How didn't you? Dude. You never read uh, Bird Whatever Rabbit? Uh, she said as if that was an unforgivable gaping hole in my elementary education. Wow. She is strict. Uh, I shot back. Did you ever read great running backs of the NFL? Good one, Steve. I'm on your side on this one. Yeah. So you, then you say, we've learned a lot from each other. Uh, although I've been to many more museums that she's, than she's been to ballparks. About 30 years ago, we went a trip to Spain when unbeknownst to us, one of Shelly's sisters entered us in a raffle. My first time in a foreign country other than Canada. Oh, which let's face it, it doesn't really count, <laughs> oops, <laughs> okay. At one point in the trip, we spent an afternoon at the renowned Prado Museum in Madrid. Love it, I've been there too. I became fascinated with one particular painting by an artist named Velázquez. Most of the Velázquez I knew about were sleek fielding middle infielders. I don't know what that is. You need to explain that to me, Papi, because I don't know what that is. What is it? The, the, baseball, the, baseball. Okay, okay, oh, okay, that's what it is. But I was really taken with this picture. It was an old painting of a buff centurion um, sitting on a stool naked, except for his helmet and a cloth draped over his over his lap. Shelley's an artist, so she was studying the composition, the color, the framing, the brush strokes. But all I could think was, how did Velasquez convince this guy to put his helmet on? Good one. This is the, what went down. Velasquez tapping his chin and thought, you know what? Put the helmet on. Centurion, what? Why? I don't want to put the helmet on. Just put the helmet on, Velasquez. Centurion, I'm naked. It's bad enough I'm naked. I don't want to be naked with my helmet on, Velasquez. Come on, try it. Centurion is like, no. All the guys at the barracks are going to laugh at me. Naked guy with his helmet on. That's stupid. You don't go into battle with your ass hanging out like that, Velasquez. All right, how about this? We do one with, one without. And now we know which one is forever enshrined in the museum. So this is the shit you think about. Yeah, yeah, and when that, and that's true. We went to the Prado, and it was like, uh, you know, and, and it's this buff guy. And I'm thinking, how did the artist? I'm thinking behind the scenes, and I'm thinking, you know, that maybe this could be a, another thing I do, which is to take old paintings and write the scene behind this behind the scenes. Of what happened before the painting happened. That's a great, that's a great thing. And this is the centurion going, nah, I'm bad enough for me. I want to be naked with my helmet. All the guys are going to make fun of me. Yes. No, it's yeah, of course. And and and, and I'll do the one that's with the helmet and the naked, and that's the one you're going to use, isn't it? Exactly. And of course, he did. That's right. It's Velasquez, and that's what he does. Yeah. So the centurion, I imagine, was pretty pissed. Yes. After that came out. You uh, weren't very empathetic. Whatever with the Instagram was <laughs> of, you know, the 1700s. Yes. Yes, it was, wasn't it? There were no filters, though. But no. uh, yeah. but there was a big time lag. Yes, yes. Would you pose a snake as a centurion? Was that, did you ever think about that? That I would pose as a naked yeah, centurion? Yeah, with a helmet on and just drape. Would you do that? No, that's why, that's why I was. I, no, I know, but. I, the centurion voice there, that's that would be me. That's what that I would, would do. Because I play football. Yes, but he did it both ways. So he's kind of like a hoe. He probably last kid put some money in there and it's like, hey, dude, here, just just do both. Shut up and do both. See, yeah. so you would have done it. But ah. it's also it's it's also something in show business that happens when that when there's an actor who doesn't uh, agree with the director or the writer's uh, interpretation of a particular line or a particular, you know, whatever choice, whether it's a costume choice or an action or something. And usually the, the solution to get every, you know, as the clock's ticking and money's being spent and you're having this debate mm -hmm. with the actor, you go, you know what, let's do one with, one without. One without. And if you can get the actor to fall for that, then you're good because you know, you're gonna use the one you wanna use. So, uh, 
So you were you were not the centur you were really Velasquez. You were being the one, the director here. Well, I, I was identifying with the centurion. Okay. Because, you know, that's you know, me, you know, being kind of like uh the the macho guy who's you know doing this foofy thing, you know, I don't know how Velasquez got him, you know, where yeah. the you know, where they put up something, a bulletin board in the barracks, you know, want to make a few extra bucks after hours. And, and the centurion said, yeah, I could use it. And then he gets there. He says, I'm going to paint your picture. And and he goes, okay, great. And he says, now take your clothes off. What? <laughs> right? Take your clothes off. I Because, you know, I'm, I, I want to take a picture of your, I, I want to paint your body. You know, I don't want to paint your, your clothing and your armor. So the guy takes his clothes off and he says, wait, 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 wait. You know what? Keep the helmet on. What? It's bad enough I'm naked. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Me with a helmet. I love it. See, my my interpretation is way more boring than yours. I would be like, the centurion is Velasquez's boyfriend, and that's all there is to it. It's like, baby, get naked. I'm gonna paint you. That could happen too. That could happen too. You know, that that's another that's another choice for leading up to that where the guy, you know, Velasquez has got a very young, buff boyfriend. Hey. And they, just, they have a trunk with a lot of props in it. One of them happened to be a helmet. There you go. Could have been that. Let's do some yeah. role playing, baby. And while they're role playing, he's painting the shit out of it without the centurion knowing it. That's another, yeah, that's just, that's another possible scenario. That's my twisted, manipulative mind. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, we both have it, just different. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. We established that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which leads me to uh, your the first time you did stand up. I love that story, and I would love for you to read it. Uh, um, yeah. Yes, I, I, and it sounds like the setting, by the way, sounds like a history book. Like, <laughs> like you and I are like have so much to have lived so long that we're like whatever we. Let me tell you what happened in nineteen seventy five. You know, it's like yeah. That's well, you know, I. <laughs> I have been fortunate in that I've never had to do anything else in my adult life. I've that never so awesome. earned, you know, nobody's ever paid me to do anything else except yeah, laugh in, you know, whether it's as a stand up or as a writer. And um, so, uh, you know, I never had to be a waiter or anything like that. I was just lucky and, and super lucky. And I know, I mean, so you're super talented and amazing. So. Yeah. But, but there's a, a, you know, some luck involved in just being born at the right time. So, um, Truth, yes, I see. Yeah. 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 That's, that's also, that was the era where stand up was like super hot, by the way, before we go into it, I just want to, uh, put a shout out from Nate. Uh, Steve Scrovan has been the most interesting and entertaining interview I've seen on your show. Hello, Steve. I love hey. Nate. <laughs> and he's probably not even from Canada, so he doesn't have to be nice. No, he's right here. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes, and I've met him in person. He's very nice, very handsome. Very uh, <laughs> you, want tell story? you want me to tell this story? Please do, yes. Yeah, well, early in the month, actually, March 9th, marked the 41st anniversary of my ever stepping in front of a microphone on the stage of a professional nightclub. And it was an old Greek restaurant in downtown Cleveland, which had been converted into uh, the Cleveland Comedy Club. And this was at the very embryonic stage of what has become known as the comedy boom of the 80s. And uh, this was literally 1980 in what I call, I call it post-apocalyptic Cleveland, where, you know, it's a, which it was a once mighty manufacturing town, which was suffering through the fate of many Rust Belt cities at that time, like Buffalo, Detroit, Pittsburgh, losing jobs and population as people fled to the booming Sun Belt. In that era, even New York City was told to drop dead. Actually, that was wow. a famous headline in the New York Post. When Gerald Ford was the president, they weren't going to give a federal bailout to New York City. And the New York Post headline said, uh, uh, Ford to New York, drop dead. That, that's a, a famous headline from the mid seventies. But this was uh, an amateur night. It was a Sunday, it was an amateur night competition the winner did be decided by a vote of the audience. So the idea was to bring as many friends as possible. And I, I came with three and the crowds were usually pretty raucous, especially since it was also billed, but Grace and uh, as heckle night. Oh, yeah. the owners would give away a Cleveland comedy club t-shirt for the best heckle of the night. I mean, imagine that, imagine, you know, never being on stage before 
and people are just screaming at you from the audience trying to win a t-shirt you know it's hard enough so <laughs> Uh, so the comics were not only in competition with each other, they were also competing with the audience. And, and later in my career, I was lucky enough to work the Apollo Theater, the famous Apollo Theater in New York. Yes. Oh, my God. Yes, yeah, I did a, a showtime at the Apollo. And the Apollo was an ashram compared to Sunday night at the Cleveland Comedy Club. So this one particular winter night, however, was it was rather dreary and the crowd was relatively low energy. And I remember one hefty tattooed biker dude taking the stage who in a couple of minutes went from looking tough and intimidating to lost and vulnerable. That's that's what being on stage can do to you doing stand up. And I got up and I, I was terrible, but everyone else was worse. And my three friends were loud. So I won the fifty dollar prize. And I came here two weeks later with different material and no friends. This time the crowd was hot. I got a lot of laughs. But another guy brought more friends and he got huge laughs telling old jokes. So he won the 50 bucks. But just as I was walking out after the show, one of the four young owners, a uh, guy not much older, probably the same age as I was at the time, I was 23. His name is Dino Vince. And he stopped me and said he was looking for local MCs. And he'd pay me $35 a week, Wednesday through Sunday. Nice. And yeah, I just turned 23. This sounded like a fortune. And to this day, like I said, no one has ever paid me money to do anything else, which proves Lincoln's adage. It turns out you can fool all the people all the time. <laughs> but I, I, I remember three bits from that night. I remember acting out a parody of there was this heartwarming, award-winning Coke commercial featuring me, Joe, excuse me, me and Joe Green of the Pittsburgh Steelers, big defensive lineman. And it's him limping to the locker room after a tough game. And, you know, uh, this, he doesn't want to be bothered by this little kid. He thinks he's looking for an autograph. And the kid instead says, would you like my Coke? And uh, me and Joe takes the Coke, drinks it. And uh, the kid says, you know, bye, me and Joe. And then walks off and me and Joe says, hey, kid. And then he tosses him his jersey. Well, my parody ended with me and Joe telling the taking the bottle and saying, hey, kid, shove this up your ass. <laughs> so that was the quality of the material I was doing. And I also made some lame reference to the Iranian hostage crisis. I was name checking whoever was the Iranian prime minister back then. And this was met with appropriate dead silence. And I will share with you the one joke I remember clearly. And you'll, you'll notice it's, it's kind of quaint. There's a quaint piece of jargon in this joke that dates it to the pre-safe sex era. But I think the math of the joke still works. And it's the very first joke I ever wrote professionally. And here it is. There's a new doll on the market that comes complete with a diaper rash. And a cream you rub on the rash that makes the rash go away. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one step away from coming out with a doll that has a social disease. Gary Gonorrhea, he cries when he pees. You better break it out. Good night. That was my very That's first joke. Gonorrhea is always a good closer. That was my first joke. He cries that is when he so pees. Fun. Yeah. That's great. So as, as a baby comic now, would you what note would you give yourself for that joke? Like, would you do it differently or? No, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's a perfect. It's a solid joke. I mean, obviously it's dated. Because the yeah. first idea of social disease, this was pre-AIDS, uh, uh, you know, probably just in the embryonic herpes era. <laughs> and, yeah, well, um, it was herpes, but they didn't probably know, right? You know as much, yeah. Yeah, so it's so it's kind of uh, you know quaint in that in that sense. But like I said, the math of it of, of it works because yeah. gonorrhea, you know, is I've never had it, but I'm told that it's painful. And when you pee, and so the idea of a, a doll that has gonorrhea that cries like a baby doll. Oh, geez, that's funny. Pees, that that kind of, you know, I think that still is valid as a as joke like material. It is because a lot of people have unsafe sex nowadays. Believe me. So not me, but a lot of people do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I never had an STD actually. F uh, TMI. But yes, never. So, yeah. 
So, so Gary. Gary, I never dated Gary. I, think Gary, Gary. I was thinking Chris is it's looking better and better for you too. Uh, yeah, definitely. Chris is looking really good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, he's uh, commenting a lot. He's, he's a great commenter. So I will, let's see. He misses that area. Okay. He says, I miss that era. Yeah. When, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, okay. Nate, I'm laughing really hard. That joke was priceless. Oh, wow. Thank you, Nate. Very nice. Um, okay. So let's see. I have so many, like, I don't, I don't think we're going to have time for all of them, but, uh, let me see what my, Oh, how to properly eat an M&M. Okay. Do, you wrote a whole thing of how you eat M&Ms. Can yeah. you instruct our audience on what's the best way to eat an M&Ms? Yes. Okay. This is the, yeah, this is, this is a piece. Um, while I enjoy a fine dark chocolate bar, either in pure form or ideally infused with sea salt or caramel, the chocolate confection I consume most often is the peanut M&M. The dark chocolate bar is the more sophisticated, artisanal, individually wrapped hybrid choice. But the peanut M&M is the populist candidate, rolled off an assembly line in a factory, mm -hmm. unpretentious, unmasked, sold in a bag like fertilizer, sometimes in a box like wine. It's a treat for the unwashed masses, and if I've qualified for anything during this quarantine, it's my proud membership in the ranks of the unwashed. <laughs> At the movie theater, in those halcyon days when we go to the movie theaters, that was my go-to buy at the concession stand. And it didn't really matter what size bag was available, regular, share, family, or fun size. To me, they were all single serving. Uh, by the way, to call the smallest one fun size is the cruelest marketing ploy I've ever heard. <laughs> Would you ever offer a starving child the smallest portion and say, no, you don't understand. This is the fun size. Come on, kids, stop crying. <laughs> This doesn't mean I just dig my hairy paw into the bag and shove the M&Ms into my slavering maw like a greedy baboon. No. There is a right way and a wrong way to eat a peanut M&M, which I will share with you now. You first, I, I should have one with me. You should first randomly pluck a single M&M out of the bag. Examine the color. Even though they all taste exactly the same, the Mars company went to a lot of trouble dyeing them different colors to reflect the diversity of this great nation. I feel I owe it to them to acknowledge that. That's step one. Step two is the most difficult part and takes some practice. Using your incisors, you gently bite down on the middle of the shell to crack it like you would an egg or a safe. Once cracked, half the shell should fall into your mouth while the other half remains in your fingers exposing the peanut, setting you up for step three. If done correctly, you will now be able to suck the peanut out of the other half of the shell to join the chocolate already melting in your mouth. Then, and only then, till you move on to the final step where you toss the remaining shell after the rest of the dismembered M&M as a chaser. This is the proper way to eat a peanut M&M. Although it may seem like a slow, meticulous OCD process, I can usually finish even the family size before the end of the last trailer. <laughs> if you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. Wow. Wow. This genius. Are you like this with every type of candy or just the M&Ms? Just the M&M. Just the M&M. It's like... But despite that, it's, I've got a pretty good assembly line going. And I can finish them pretty quickly. That's it's yeah. Back. It's very impressive. Very yeah. impressive. Uh, look here, in Nate again. Does Steve Groban has have a Facebook page or Instagram? I can like or follow. He has a new fan. This guy's just so damn entertaining. I do. It's under my name, and you can all all of my sheltered in place three hundred sixty five of them are archived there, so you can go through them and um, read them to your friends out loud, just like I did you. They're so fun. I'm a, I'm, well, obviously I'm a fan because this is the second time we're talking about them. 
and I hope you come back because there's like so many more. Uh, okay, let me pick another one. All right. Uh, that I I like I like them all, but like something that's uh, ooh, this is good. Okay, so TV sex versus real sex. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This this is uh, my son has been here and he kind of turned us on, onto this uh, TV series that we had missed. It's off the air now, but ran for four years on AMC. Uh, so I will read this. This was uh, day three fifty five. We're just catching up to a good series that had a four season run on AMC called Halt and Catch Fire. It's a period piece set in the eighties about the beginnings of the tech revolution that brought about the information age. These are extremely ambitious characters who occasionally engage in sex, staged and choreographed, and what has become what I think is a cliche in TV and movies. The characters' eyes meet, they make a psychic connection, then they smash, they, they smash cut to a body, usually the woman banging up against the wall, as if the director told the male actor, pretend you're an offensive tackle and she's a blocking sled. <laughs> groaning and gasping these people are so hot for each other the woman furiously fumbles to unbuckle the man's belt as the man rips the woman's shirt over her head buttons are flying everywhere all sorts of knickknacks and patty wax heedlessly swept off the credenza in a fireball of passion passion, passion. in the Kama Sutra this move is labeled the Harvey Wallbanger ironically this is not the kind of sex scene you ever see in a show about superheroes. This is what my son pointed out. Just despite their extraordinary powers, superheroes tend to engage in much gentler lovemaking. Maybe the computer nerds are overcompensating for their otherwise sedentary lifestyle. See, this is what happens when you spend hours playing Super Mario. But actual superheroes have to be more careful about slamming loved ones against walls. They risk hurtling straight through the, <laughs> they, they risk hurtling them straight through the wall into another dimension. Yeah. Now here's how the scene would play out in real life. The man and woman stumble to the wall, boom. She yelps in pain, ow! <laughs> the hell's wrong with you? I think I got a pen and pencil set stuck in my ass. Oh shit. Look, we broke the frame on this picture. It's my parents and their honeymoon in New Smyrna Beach. You know what? I think it's time for you to leave. But then again, who wants to see that? Exactly. <laughs> oh, that's that's genius. I love that. Uh, did you ever write a sex scene or direct one? Did you ever have a chance to do that? No, no, no. no. Well, actually, in Raymond, uh, I wrote for uh, nine years on Raymond, there were... Um, we, we did a lot of scenes where they're in bed and, and Ray's, you know, and, and Deborah are, are in various, uh, you know, trying to engage in sex. And I, one of the early episodes I wrote, uh, which it was called All I Want for Christmas. And it was basically, it was, it was uh, Ray, uh, it's Christmas morning, and Ray, uh, supposedly the kids have um, uh open their presents every day. And Ray has got the vacuum cleaner out and he's uh, vacuuming. Now, Shelly has always told me when I've done this kind of thing, that that is a, like a huge turn on for her to watch me do domestic things. Oh my God, I love your wife. And so I, I took that idea and I put this in this episode. So Ray is is vacuuming and Deborah comes down and she's turned on because he's vacuuming. You know, and he's like in his boxer shorts, his hair is got bed hair. It's not, you know, he's not like, in a in you know uh, <laughs> he's not like in a, a denim uh, you know workout outfit but he so that was the episode and so now Ray is like oh my god you're turned on but the family's coming over to have Christmas dinner and we can't consummate this and so it was an episode about Christmas getting in the way of their having sex and so Ray is just every, trying to do everything he can to end the festivities hustle everybody out. <laughs> and finally that happens and he gets uh, uh, Deborah into bed and then uh, they had a gift exchange and, and Ray had given actually uh, Ray had given uh, Robert uh, golf balls for a present but Robert had given Ray a remote control plane like a really nice gift and Ray felt so bad that he said you know what Robert why don't you keep the plane 
test it out for me, you know? And Robert was more than happy to take the gift back for himself. So now later on, Ray and Deborah are in bed and they're about to, you know, constantly in the morning and crash. The remote, control, the remote control plane comes crashing through the window, interrupting it once again. Robert comes up above the windowsill. Oh, sorry about that. And, <laughs> again. and that is a great sex life. That is a great sex scene. That's, yeah. I love it. That's great. So you drew a lot of your inspiration from your real life. Everybody on Raymond did that, right? Yeah. yeah. They're all stories, you know, were usually cut from some incident or some exchange or some conflict or something. And we just elaborated on them and, and kind of did the part you don't see. And a matter of fact, uh, my joke was that um, Shelly and I, when we'd be having an argument, she would say, she she would tell people that she'd say, she'd see my eyes kind of go up like this. And she'd go, this is not for the show. This is not for the show. And then I would say, well, Shelly, this, look at how much they pay you for an episode. She goes, okay, this is for the show. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> and sometimes we artificially extend the argument just to get a second act. So, uh, oh, stop it. You do so that. The wives, the wives would get hip to it. And I, I'll tell this one other story real quickly. It's not mine, it's my friend Lou Schneider, who is also a, a, a writer on the show and his lovely life, uh, Liz. Um, and, uh, I've told this story uh, on his behalf before, but it's his story. Uh, they were, you know, by season seven or eight, the the, the spouses were kind of hip to the fact that if something goes wrong, maybe there's a story in it, even though it's bad in the, at the time. And he was on a ski trip with his family, and they were at the end of the day, and they got all their ski equipment. They're coming up in the elevator of the hotel, and the elevator door opens, and Lou drops his keys on the floor and they go in the crack between the elevator and the floor. And he's trying to fish the keys out. You can see them. He's trying to fish them out as the elevator and, and, and Liz is standing by the door trying to hold it. <laughs> and he's like cursing his, you know, he's pissed off trying to get the keys out and Liz, trying to calm the situation says, well, Loom, you know, maybe there's a story in this. And he goes, no, no. We already did a story where Ray dropped his wedding ring down a heating grate. So we've already done that story. This is just something shitty that happened. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, uh, that's great. That's a great story. I love that. <laughs> Can't use it. We've already done it. Yeah. What a waste of catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. That's uh, that's such it's, it's a great story. And I think I this one. Uh, there's another one that sheltered in place day three forty eight. Yeah. Um, and it's about working out when you're older. And again, so really, <laughs> this is a great. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so do you do you want to? It's it's a short piece. Do you, yeah. you want to? Because yeah, you do yeah. better than I do. Yeah. It's it's. Uh, I'm always looking to stay fit. Yes. Which of course, you know, gets harder the older you get. And recently somebody told me, you know what's a good workout? Gardening. <laughs> Gardening. Wait, are you shitting me? Gardening? That's insulting. I was an athlete in college. I played football. Every year we got pre-tested. We got tested at preseason camp where we had to run a mile for time and 520 in my case and do 10 40-yard sprints with only 20-second rest in between, each also for time. Not only that, I had to do 18 pull-ups and branch press 250 pounds max. Mm -hmm. So in the summer before my senior year, I trained for the sprints by taking only 10 second intervals so that when I did it for real in summer camp, the 20 seconds would seem like a vacation. <laughs> so after finishing, and this is absolutely true, after finishing the last of the 10 sprints, I took one cleansing breath. I went, <sighs> and that's all I needed to get my wind back, you know, 21 years old. I used to run four seven forty, and you're telling me a good workout is gardening. So I went out, planted some flowers, pulled some weeds. God damn it! The next day I could barely walk. <laughs> yes. Uh, copy that. Uh, <laughs> how do you feel? I mean, because I I used to be a competitive swimmer, so. Mm -hmm. 
but I still think I can, you know, and, and that's how I broke my, I screwed up my knee and stuff. Cause then years later, uh, I decided to do Krav Maga and yeah, I, that's how I tore my meniscus. I did all kinds of damage because you still think that you can do that. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. It, you have to, and, and, uh, you know, I, I play uh, in a softball game. I used to. I haven't played in a year. Uh, where the age range is like seventy-five to twenty-five. Wow. And the guys who get hurt the most are the guys like between thirty-five and forty-five, because yeah. their brain <laughs> is not caught up to where their body is. Oh. They, you know, old guys like me. I know I'm going to need twenty minutes in the outfield doing my yoga poses and I don't care how douchey it looks. I can't. Do you do or, that? Yes, I'm gonna oh, do so the, I'm gonna do the, the the arrow, you know, I'm gonna do all these things to the back and the squats and the you know hamstring things. Yeah. And I don't care. I know I've got to do that. Otherwise I'm gonna run down to first base full speed and my hamstring is going to pop and roll up my leg like a piano wire and I'm, I'm going to look like Willem Dafoe in fucking uh, uh, platoon like ah! <laughs> so the older the younger guys don't get here because they're still elastic the yes. older guys know better but it's these guys in this middle age 35, 45, 50 where they haven't figured out how to prepare for what their body is going to allow them to do. Yes. Yes, because you feel like when I was doing Krav Maga, I was like, yeah, I can whoop your ass. And then my knee was like, no, bitch, you can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You, you know, one one false move. And uh, and the thing is, is, you know, that could have happened when you were younger. But yeah. when you were younger, you also heal. Oh, you heal fat. Oh, no, I would do all kinds of crazy shit when I was younger. Like yeah. I would run with weights in my ankles. Like, oh, yeah. for example, I would swim. I would do weights like that I had no business doing. Like, super. And I was like, yeah, I can yes. do this. I'm fine. And never hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a tight muscle here and there, but that was it. Yeah. I miss those days. Nate is asking what position I played in football. I, in, yes, I there. in high school, I was a running back. Uh, and in college, I was uh, a, a safety, a defensive back, and a punt returner. Nice. There's your answer, Nate. Thank, Thank you for asking questions. Um, okay, so how about I think <laughs> this piece colonoscopy would be a great piece to end on poop. <laughs> We're going out classy, huh? Yeah. Well, it's a bit closer. You know, it's a big sell of poop. It's, it's yeah. Big in comedy, you know, sex, death, death, and shit. Those are the three things we go to, right? In comedy. That's right. And, and yeah. And if you have good sex and die, you could shit in both of those cases. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> good so, point. That's your next, that should be your 366 day piece. Remember what you just yeah. said. Well, this, yeah. actually, this actually came about when I was, uh, I do this uh, podcast with Ralph Nader and uh, my associate producer who kind of writes our scripts beforehand. We were, going through the script the night before and we were discussing whether this, you know, to use a period or a semicolon and the idea of semicolonoscopy came up to me. So <laughs> I'll just read it the way that the, the way I wrote it was writing a sentence for a script and was wondering whether to use a period or a semicolon, which got me to thinking that I'm probably due for a colonoscopy. You know how your mind works like that. Of course. That, that got me to wondering if there was a less invasive procedure called a semicolonoscopy. <laughs> they, they stick the tube only halfway up your ass. And uh, my wife, Shelly, who we've all gotten to know now, is the daughter of a doctor, which means she can diagnose ailments and prescribe medications <laughs> with far more confidence and certainty than a real doctor, because no one's going to her. Of she informed me that there, in fact, was such a procedure. It was called a sigmoidoscopy. And so I looked it up, and it was is named after its inventor, Dr. Sig Moyd, a proctologist with commitment issues. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love that. It's a fun piece. Well, and I have to give my daughter Julia. This was this writing these things was kind of a family affair. They were my writing staff. Shelley was kind of the head writer, but <laughs> I was the head writer. But Shelley was my you know uh, head consultant, and right. uh, I can't. I came downstairs uh, and Julie was home at the time. She's, you know, in her late twenties, but um, 
I said, I'm looking for, uh, I have this joke. I want to say something about a Dr. Sigmoid. What kind of, and he's a proctologist who what what's the joke what's the joke you know because he's there's only halfway up the act and julia said proctologist with commitment issues <laughs> that made me laugh very hard oh, it's very yeah. funny get all the way up your ass and so <laughs> that made me laugh and that's what got it in and that's what made this whole uh, sheltered in place diary a real family affair <laughs> that's great well, there's so many other pieces that I would like. Would you come back? Anytime. Oh, thank you. So we'll. Cause only only if Nate and Chris show up. Oh, totally. Okay. So, oh, look at this. Nate, go Nate. Steve Scroven is now on my list of favorite all-time comedians and comedic writers of all time. Thank wow. you for brightening your weekend with this uh, wonderful uh, hour of comedy. Thank you, Nate. And thank yes, you, Nate. Steve is bomb. You are bomb as fuck. Like Nate, my millennial manager would say. <laughs> that, Nate, that means more to me than, uh, uh, you know, probably going the other way. So it means just as much at least. So thank you. <laughs> and then Chris, good show guys. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you so much, Steve, for always having fun here. Uh, we, I, I enjoy your children in place. You know, I'm a big fan and you should put all this into a book. I told you that before, like many times, right? Are you going to do that? Well, I've looked, I've been looking into it. The problem yeah. is, is, um, there are a couple problems. I'm not a celebrity. And, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm accomplished in my field, but I'm not a famous person and it's hard to sell books. And, uh, uh, I don't think it applies, but when they hear that this is a diary done during quarantine, uh, editors, agents, publishers, all they're, they're kind of going, oh, everybody's burned out on pandemic. Nobody wants to hear about it, talk about it. But this stuff is kind of evergreen and fun. Yeah. Anyway, so right. I'm still trying, but um, I'm, you know, it, it will be, it's a long shot. But they, they would, of course, that they would make uh, like great sketches, some of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They really would. I, it's it's the, the whole thing was kind of my my version of a Netflix special. Yeah. No, seriously. Yeah. It's great. So, well, okay. we'll we'll have you back. So thank you again. Thank you everybody for tuning in. I'll see you guys next Sunday. Bye.